Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The United States has formally initiated the process to withdraw from the World Health Organization. See, a couple of months ago, we had discussed that US President Donald Trump had blamed the World Health Organization for failing to prevent the global spread of the pandemic by bowing down to Chinese influence. He even went to the extent of accusing the WHO for colluding with China for falsifying information and misreporting data related to COVID-19. Based on this accusation, President Trump declared that the United States would be immediately cutting funding to the WHO and he also declared that the US would quit the organization in protest. So accordingly, the United States has initiated the formal process to withdraw from the WHO. So in this context, let us talk about the formal procedure that a member country needs to follow while quitting the WHO. See, as per the constitution of the WHO, if a member country wishes to quit, then it needs to provide a one-year notice and clear all the pending dues to the organization within this notice period. So once all the pending dues are cleared, at the end of the notice period, the member country would have officially quit the World Health Organization. So as per this established procedure, the US has initiated the formal proceedings. So by July 2021, the US would have officially quit the organization. So let us evaluate whether the accusations of Donald Trump against the WHO were justified and also talk about the impact on the functioning of WHO if the US were to cut funding and quit the organization. See, as alleged by Donald Trump, there is evidence available to indicate that China did hide information and falsify data related to COVID-19. Then it is also true that the WHO praised China's efforts in containing the spread of the disease because China did manage to effectively contain the spread at the epicenter that is in Wuhan. It is also true that the WHO has been time and again criticized by a number of experts for being very slow in its reaction to emerging epidemics. Experts around the world had criticized the WHO for its delay in declaring COVID-19 as a pandemic. But using these facts to allege a link between the WHO and the Chinese government and to accuse the WHO of falling under the influence of China is completely unfair and unjustified. To understand why, you need to look at the structural problems that the WHO is facing, just like any other international organization. See, the WHO, which was constituted in 1948, has become outdated and it is dealing with a number of structural issues that makes the WHO quite ineffective while dealing with the healthcare challenges of today. For example, while dealing with infectious diseases that have the potential to turn into an epidemic or a pandemic, the WHO cannot collect its own data and it cannot carry out its own investigations in member countries. Instead, it has to merely rely upon the information and the data that is reported to it by the member countries. So if the governments of member countries are not transparent while sharing the data and if they falsify information, there is no way for the WHO to correct this data on its own and the WHO does not have any powers to penalize such countries. So these structural shortcomings severely restricts the effectiveness of WHO. So for this reason, it has been urged that urgent reforms are needed at the WHO in order to make it an effective multilateral global organization that can deal with the healthcare challenges of today. So the United States, which is the most important member of the WHO, should have worked towards reforming the organization by promoting cooperation amongst the member countries. But instead, the Trump government has chosen to blame the WHO and has announced to cut funding to the organization and has even begun the formal process to quit the organization. See, to understand why the United States is the most important member of the WHO, we need to look at the funding sources of the organization. There are two routes through which the WHO raises its funding. One is through assessed contribution and the other is through voluntary contribution. See, assessed contribution is more like a membership fee that every member country has to mandatorily pay. It is a fixed contribution based on the country's GDP and the United States alone contributes around $400 million to the WHO in assessed contribution. Apart from this, a member country is free to make voluntary contributions as well. And the US is known to contribute around another $400 million as voluntary contributions through various government agencies and departments. 
So this makes the United States the topmost contributor to the WHO with a total contribution of around $850 million every year, which amounts to around 15% of the total contribution that the WHO receives. So if the United States decides to cut off this funding, it would be a major blow to the functioning of the WHO and it is going to have a severe impact on the role of the WHO in promoting global health. While the US government has the powers to decide on quitting the organization and cutting off the voluntary contribution, it is still not clear whether the US government alone can decide on cutting off the assist contribution as well. Because legal and constitutional experts in the United States have said that assist contribution to the WHO can be cut only after the government obtains congressional approval. Despite these legal hurdles, the Trump government has decided to cut contributions to the WHO and it has decided to quit the organization. So that's the reason why the Trump administration has been facing a lot of criticism for its unilateral actions. Even close allies of the United States, such as West European countries, have criticized the Trump administration for crippling the functioning of the WHO during a pandemic. And of course, China has also criticized the United States for shifting blame to the shortcomings of the WHO for its own failure to contain the pandemic. In fact, the US government has been facing criticism within the US Congress as well. Because if the topmost contributor of funds to the WHO decides to cut off funding, then it will severely undermine global efforts to tackle the pandemic. Because the WHO works as the lead organization for promoting global research and it recommends the containment strategies that need to be followed by governments around the world. The WHO also plays the lead role in promoting the development of vaccines and drugs that are very much needed in our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. Then a cut in its funding will also affect its ability to fight against several other global healthcare challenges as well, such as the containment of other infectious diseases such as HIV, promotion of maternal and infant healthcare in order to bring down the MMR and IMR rates and it will also affect WHO's ability to fight against non-communicable diseases and lifestyle disorders. So in short, if the United States, which is the topmost contributor to the WHO, if it decides to cut off funding, then it will expose a number of developing and underdeveloped countries which have very weak public health care systems and it will expose their population to severe health risks. Then for the sake of prelims, please note that India's contribution to the WHO, which includes both assessed contribution and voluntary contribution, amounts to around 0.48% of WHO's total funding. Now let's take up a column from page number 7, in which the writers examine the flawed economic development model that we follow, which ignores environmental concerns, and how this could directly pave the way for socio-economic disasters such as pandemics to take place. So this is essentially a debate between the differing objectives of growth versus conservation. See, there is no doubt that economic growth is needed for sustaining livelihoods. But at the same time, we need to understand that environment conservation is also equally important because destruction of our environment can also affect livelihoods. So when growth is unregulated and when economic growth is pursued in an unsustainable manner, it leads to destruction of our environment which in turn affects livelihoods. So to strike a balance between these two differing objectives, what we need is to practice sustainable development that respects and understands environmental concerns. And we need a development model that factors the environmental cost of growth. Because industrial growth and agricultural growth can only come at the cost of the environment. The cost for expanding our economic activities has to be always paid by our environment. The writers point out how unsustainable economic growth can result in the destruction of wild habitats and forests, thus significantly increasing the chances of man-animal conflict. According to the writers, such rampant destruction of the environment and the habitat ends up exposing us to a number of harmful pathogens which were earlier confined only to the wild. The writers point out how our unsustainable economic practices have reduced diversity and resilience amongst all living forms, including human beings. Take for example, our practice of promoting monoculture cropping. This has reduced plant diversity and the inherent resilience of plants to harmful pathogens. But in this context, the writers are talking about not just microscopic pathogens, but they are also talking about 
increasing incidence of pest infestation seen amongst plants. Then also look at how unsustainable livestock farming purely for economic reasons has compromised diversity and resilience amongst animals. Then dense urbanization and poor sanitation and hygiene has also affected resilience amongst human beings. This reduction in diversity and resilience has exposed all living forms to a number of wild pathogens. So in this context, the writers evaluate the role of India's Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change during the pandemic. See, India's Environmental Ministry is the nodal ministry for balancing the needs of growth and conservation and for promoting sustainable development. But contrary to this mandate, the Environment Ministry has approved a number of controversial projects and laws that too at a time when the country was battling a pandemic and going through the impact of a lockdown. Over the last four months, we have spoken about a number of controversial projects that the MOEF has approved, including the Italian hydropower project in the biodiversity-rich Dibang Valley of Arunachal Pradesh. We have discussed the controversial approval that the ministry gave for a coal mine in Assam's Dehing Patkai Elephant Reserve. Similarly, the Environment Ministry has approved diamond mining in the Panna Forest. It has granted approval for a coal mine and a thermal power plant in the forests of Odisha. It has approved limestone mining in the Gir National Park of Gujarat. It has also approved a geotechnical investigation in the Sharavati Lion Tail Macau Sanctuary of Karnataka. But apart from these controversial projects that the ministry has approved, which threatens our protected areas, wild habitats and forests, the most controversial decision is related to the draft environment impact assessment rules that the environment ministry has brought out into the public domain. See, we have discussed the importance of environment impact assessment for environment conservation on the 13th of March and we have also discussed the provisions of the draft EIA on the 29th of June. But in this column, the writers point out the specific drawbacks of the draft EIA that threatens environment conservation. First, they criticize the Environment Ministry for providing such a narrow deadline for receiving feedback from the public and from experts. Earlier, the Environment Ministry had set the deadline for June 30th and it was only with the intervention of the Delhi High Court that the deadline has been extended to the 11th of August. This provides more time and opportunity for generating a more broad-based feedback from the public and from environmental experts. The biggest drawback of the draft EIA is that it allows for projects to begin even before obtaining the required environmental clearances. Under the earlier EIA rules, if the construction of a project were to begin without obtaining the required clearances, then it was being treated as a violation and the proponents of the project would be penalized accordingly. But the new draft rules does not treat this as a violation and it allows for projects to begin even before obtaining the required environmental clearances. It basically allows for post facto regularization. Basically, a project which has begun without obtaining the required clearances can be regularized under the new EIA rules instead of being penalized for being an illegal project. The second biggest drawback of the draft EIA is that it exempts public hearings for projects that have been classified as strategic projects. See, public hearings are the most important component of the EIA process because it is the only platform that is available to the project affected people, to the environmental experts and social experts to raise their voice against the environmental cost and environmental impact of these projects. But according to the new rules, projects that have been classified as strategic projects, they will be exempted from public hearings and this denies the opportunity to the project affected people and the experts to raise their concerns against the project. The draft rules also provide for a lot of arbitrariness in classifying strategic projects and this provides local authorities with a lot of discretion which can be easily misused. So the concern is that this provision could be misused to classify a project that is harmful to the environment as a strategic project in order to exempt it from public hearings. Then the draft rules do not address the gaps in monitoring, compliance and safeguards and the lack of improvement in this regard allows project developers to exploit these gaps. When monitoring and safeguards are weak, it affects compliance, leading project developers to commit more violations. So according to the writers, the draft EIA further promotes environmental degradation for the sake of promoting unsustainable economic growth 
even at the cost of affecting our own environment and biodiversity. Now let's take up an article from page number 8 that sheds more light on the controversy surrounding the Malabar rebellion. See, we have discussed this topic a couple of times through a practice question and as well as through an article over the last couple of months. But it is very important to understand the controversy surrounding the Malabar rebellion as the centenary celebrations of the rebellion is approaching in 2021. See, there are a number of historians and people who refer to the Malabar rebellion as a nationalist movement against British colonial rule. There are few others who refer to it as a religious movement that began on religious grounds and not as a national movement. There are others who refer to the Malabar rebellion as planned communal violence against the Hindus. But a critical evaluation of the Malabar rebellion shows that this uprising was multifarious in its nature and this has been brought out by the accounts and works of K.P. Keswamenon. See, K.P. Keswamenon happens to be a very important figure in India's freedom struggle. He was the grandson of the Maharaja of Palghat and he went on to become a member of the Home Rule League under Annie Besant. As a progressive leader and thinker, he went on to fight against the practice of untouchability which was widely practiced in Kerala during the 1900s and he fought for its abolition by leading the Vaikom Satyagraha in 1924. He also founded the popular Matrabhumi newspaper which is considered to be an important publication during India's freedom struggle. Through his various books and accounts, K.P. Kesava Menon has brought out the multifarious nature of the Malabar rebellion or also known as the Mopla rebellion or the Mapila rebellion. See, the Malabar rebellion began in 1921 as an uprising by the Mopla Muslim peasants of the Malabar region and this uprising was targeted against the British colonial government. The uprising began in support of the Khilafat movement that had taken root in India in order to oppose the replacement of the Caliph of Turkey by the British. So as you can see, the uprising did have a religious angle to it, but the opposition of Muslim peasants to British colonial rule gave it a nationalist angle as well. So this dual nature of the uprising has been acknowledged by K.P. Keswamenon as well. Through his critical works and accounts, he also recognizes the social angle that existed in the conflict. See, as the Mopila peasants started attacking British officers and the positions of the British government, the uprising also turned against the landlords, most of whom happened to be upper caste Hindus. The class-based exploitation of the peasants, which was done by the landlords with the support of the British colonial government, gave it a social angle as well. But the violence that followed that was carried out by Muslim peasants against Hindu landlords gave it a communal angle as well. K.P. Keswamenon recognizes how the nationalist movement acquired a communal angle, leading to forced conversion and violent clashes between Hindu and Muslim mobs. But K.P. Keswamenon also recognizes that the social divide and the communal divide seen during the Malabar rebellion was an extension of the divide and rule policy of the British government. As the Hindus and the Muslims fought against each other and as the peasants fought against the landlords, the British continued to strengthen their stronghold over the subcontinent. So understanding the multifarious nature of the Malabar rebellion is very important as the centenary celebrations approach and as there is a controversy raging over the role of Varyam Kunnat Kun Hamad Haji who led the Malabar rebellion. Now let's take up an article from page number 10. The UAE's ambassador to India has said that his country is keen to sign an open skies agreement with India. When two countries sign such an open skies agreement, it would allow the commercial airline carriers from both the countries to run unlimited number of flights between the two based on passenger demand. This will help in providing better prices and better service to the customer and more importantly, it will help in improving connectivity between the two countries. If an open skies agreement is missing, then both the countries will have to sign a bilateral agreement and mutually determine the number of flights that are allowed to fly between the two sides. But such a protective sky policy basically restricts competition and it is usually done in order to protect the interests of the domestic carriers. See, under India's National Civil Aviation Policy of 2016, the open sky policy has been recognized and it allows the government to enter into an open skies agreement with another country based on the principle of reciprocity. But the National Civil Aviation Policy restricts the open sky treatment only to Sark nations 
and to countries that are located beyond 5,000 km radius from New Delhi. This provision has been deliberately included in order to exclude the Gulf carriers who pose a direct threat to India's domestic airlines. This is because if India enters into an open skies agreement with countries such as UAE, then Gulf carriers such as Emirates and Etihad, they would enjoy the fifth and sixth freedom of air that has been recognized under international treaties and by the International Civil Aviation Organization. As per the fifth and sixth freedom of air, flights that are operating from one country to another can take the passengers of the other country to a third country as well. So in the case of India and UAE, when there is no open skies agreement and when UAE has been deliberately excluded from the open skies policy through this condition, it allows India to determine the number of flights that can fly into India from UAE, thus protecting the market of Indian carriers, that is the passengers who are flying from India to another third country. India's concern is that if it signs an open skies agreement with the UAE, then Gulf carriers such as Emirates and Etihad can fly unlimited number of flights into India and under the 5th and 6th freedom of air, they can even take Indian passengers to other third countries, thereby eating up the market share of Indian carriers. Next, we have an article on page number 14, according to which Sri Lankan fishermen from the Jaffna Peninsula of the Northern Province, especially from Point Pedro, have observed a sudden increase in the number of Indian trawling boats that have been fishing in Sri Lankan waters. This development has reignited the old problem of India-Sri Lanka fishermen dispute, which has been going on since the days of the civil war in Sri Lanka. See, even though the maritime boundary between India and Sri Lanka has been clearly demarcated, the fishermen dispute has been going on for a number of decades. The Sri Lankan Navy, Coast Guard and the fishermen have often accused that fishermen from the Indian state of Tamil Nadu cross over the maritime boundary line and carry out illegal fishing in Sri Lankan waters, particularly around Point Pedro and Kachativo Island. They also accuse the Indian fishermen of using mechanized trawling boats which affects the availability of fish and also damages the fishing nets and boats of Sri Lanka. Over the years, this dispute has led the Sri Lankan Navy and Coast Guard to arrest and even shoot at a number of Indian fishermen and the death of any Indian fishermen in these incidents has turned into an emotive issue which has the potential to affect India's bilateral relations with Sri Lanka. This dispute has also led to violence and clashes between fishermen of both the countries and in order to resolve this dispute, a joint working group had been constituted by both the countries. But over the years, the joint working group has not made any considerable progress and it has failed to work out a solution through which the fishermen dispute could have been resolved. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. The SPA conference in Belgium was held following the signing of Treaty of Versailles. Option C is the right answer. This question has been asked because the 100 years ago article on page number 7 makes a reference to the SPA conference of 1920. See, SPA is a town in Belgium where a meeting was held between the Supreme War Council of the Allied countries which included United Kingdom, US, France, etc. and representatives of the government of the Weimar Republic which had been defeated in the First World War. After the Axis powers led by Germany was defeated in the First World War, a peace treaty known as the Treaty of Versailles was signed in 1919. As per the peace treaty, Germany had to fulfill a number of commitments. According to the peace treaty, Germany was supposed to disarm itself, provide mandatory shipment of coal to the Allied powers and also to pay war reparations for the damages caused by Germany during the First World War, which was essentially triggered by the Axis powers. So after the Treaty of Versailles was signed, there was a need to check whether Germany was following its commitments and the Allied powers felt that any issues related to the implementation of the peace treaty should be discussed in a face-to-face -face conference and this led to the SPA conference in Belgium which brought together the representatives of the Supreme War Council of the Allied powers and representatives of the German government for the first time after the First World War had been brought to an end by signing the Treaty of Versailles. Now let's take up the next practice question. The 86th Amendment Act of 2002 to the Indian Constitution inserted which article? The correct answer is option B, Article 21A. See, the 86th Amendment Act introduced Article 21A into the Indian Constitution and it also amended 
Article 45 and Article 51A. But the question clearly mentions as to which new article was introduced through the 86th Amendment Act. So hence, the correct answer is option B, Article 21A. See, the 86th Amendment Act essentially introduced right to education as a fundamental right. Prior to that, under the directive principles of state policy, that is under Part 4 of the Indian Constitution, the state was mandated to fund equitable education and ensure equitable access to education under Article 45 and under Article 39. But by 1990s, the demand for recognizing right to education as a fundamental right was growing and it was first recognized by the Ram Murthy Committee Report of 1990. Then in 1993, the Supreme Court passed a landmark judgment in the Uni Krishnan case where it held that education is a fundamental right flowing from Article 21. Following this judgment, the government had established the Tapas Majumdar Committee in order to examine the expenses in the education sector and this committee went on to recommend the insertion of Article 21A. Based on these recommendations, a few years later, 86th Amendment Act was introduced to the Constitution, which introduced a new article known as Article 21A into Part 3 of the Indian Constitution. This article recognized right to education as a fundamental right for children in the age group of 6 to 14 years. The same Amendment Act also made changes to Article 45 and Article 51A in order to place new responsibilities on the government by amending the directive principles and place new responsibilities on the parents by amending the fundamental duties. So as a follow-up to the 86th Amendment Act, Right to Education Act was passed in 2009. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 8 according to which the Karnataka High Court has placed a stay on the orders of the government of Karnataka which had banned online classes. The High Court has held that banning online classes during the pandemic would amount to violation of Article 21 and Article 21A because the 86th Amendment Act and the Uni Krishnan case have both clearly recognized that right to education is a fundamental right that flows from these articles. Now let's take up the next practice question. Which of the following are incorrectly matched? On one side we have evacuation missions of the Indian Navy and on the other hand we have the countries where the missions were carried out. First, we have Operation Samudra Setu matched with Iraq. Then we have Operation Rahat matched with Yemen. Then we have Operation Sukun matched with Lebanon and Operation Safecoming matched with Libya. Amongst the given options, the first match is incorrect. So the correct answer is option A, one only, because the question is asking you to identify the incorrect match. See, under Operation Rahat, Operation Sukun and Operation Safecoming, the Indian Navy evacuated Indian nationals and as well as foreign nationals from conflict-hit countries such as Yemen, Lebanon and Libya respectively. Whereas under Operation Samudra Setu, the Indian Navy has been running an evacuation mission in order to bring back Indian nationals who have been stuck in other countries during the COVID-19 pandemic. Under Operation Samudra Setu, the Indian Navy has run evacuation missions to Maldives, Sri Lanka and Iran but not to Iraq. This question has been asked because on page number 11 we have an article according to which the Indian Navy has concluded Operation Samudra Setu. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. Which of the following statements are correct? Proper design and effective implementation of UN Red Plus program can significantly contribute to protection of biodiversity, resilience of forest ecosystems, poverty reduction. All the three statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. See, UN Red Plus stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. It's a collaborative program which was started by the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations Development Program and the UNEP. This program was established in 2008 as a response to the decisions of the Climate Change Convention that were included under the Bali Action Plan. The focus of the UN Red Plus program is to reduce emissions by bringing down deforestation and forest degradation. So this will not only help in protecting biodiversity and making forest ecosystems more resilient, but it will also help in reducing poverty because livelihoods are dependent on our habitats. And please do not confuse the UN Red Plus program with Red Plus, which is a voluntary climate change initiative that has been started by the member countries of the Climate Change Convention. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, discuss the process of withdrawal from the WHO and evaluate the impact of US quitting the organization. The second question, critically evaluate the draft environment impact assessment 
that is being pushed through during a pandemic for its ecological impact? Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.